In this video, I will show you how to create the game Flappy Bird using only 10 lines of code. But first, do you know the story behind the game? Flappy Bird was created by a Vietnamese developer in just three days, and it was released in May of 2013 on the Apple App Store as a free-to-play game with ads. Flappy Bird's design is minimalistic. You simply tap to flap, avoid the pipes, and of course, try to get a higher score than your friends. Flappy Bird had very few players until it unexpectedly went viral in January of 2014. It quickly climbed to the top of the app charts and reportedly earned the creator $50,000 a day from ads. But this success came with a downside. The creator observed the addictive nature of his game and the potential harmful impact it could be causing on players' lives. In a move that shocked the gaming world, the developer removed Flappy Bird from the app stores. This is something worth thinking about, because I think most game devs would love to create an addictive game. Now that you know the story behind Flappy Bird, let's recreate it. I'm going to follow the same format as my last video, where I create the game with a constraint of using only 10 lines of code. This constraint is a great way to break down something complex into something that anyone can understand. And since GDevelop is a no-code game engine, I translated the 10 lines of code to mean that I can only use 10 actions in my events. Let's get started. First, let's create the player character. We're going to create a new object and we're going to search the asset store. And I want to use this asset bundle that I just bought. If I click on owned and I found a cat character that I thought would be fun, especially because I absolutely adore alliteration. So we should make this game called Flappy Feline. Here it is. We will add this to the scene and let's see what it looks like. Ooh, it's very small, but we can increase its size. I want to show the grid. If I hold shift, it'll keep the same aspect ratio. And I'm going to make it about, let's see, 128 by 128. And this is what it looks like in the game. Okay, perfect. So now how are we going to make this player move? I'm planning on using the platformer behavior. This will let us do jumps and has gravity. Oops, I made it a platform. It needs to be the platformer character. And then we'll take off this platform. That was a mistake. No big deal. Now we have gravity and we can jump. Well, we can't jump because we have nothing to stand on. Let's add a ground object. If we search, I'm going to search for tiled sprites. It makes it easy to draw ground. Okay, we'll use this green one. It's called water, but we're going to call it floor. And this one we'll just call cat. Let's put the floor down here, make it the right size. And this one we will give the platform behavior just so you can see how it normally works. That's all it takes to get a platformer game working. But that's not the type of game we're making. In this built-in behavior, I can only jump one time for each time I hit the ground. So the first thing I need to do is enable multiple jumps. In fact, I want unlimited jumps because I'm basically going to be flying. So the first thing we can do is click on the cat and we will say allow jumping again. So that's the only event we have so far. So now I can go as high as I want and I will be flying like a cat. Well, flying like a bird. It's a flappy feline. Perfect. In the Flappy Bird game, you're constantly going to the right, and the player doesn't really need to control that. It's just going to happen automatic. So we will make an action that tells the cat to simulate a key press, and we'll save the right key press. All right. So no matter what, that cat's going to keep going, and it'll go off the screen. So we we'll obviously need the camera to follow that cat. If we use the behavior called smooth camera, that will follow the cat. We just want to follow on the x-axis only, left and right. So let's try this. Okay, there it's moving. And jump. Oh, it's still letting me control. I'll let the player we don't want control. To let the player control the, the movement. So we need to disable the default controls. That's under the platformer object. Now the player can't control his cat at all, which is good because we can't go left and right, but it's bad because now we can't jump. Let's do an or because I like to give players lots of options on how to control their character. Let's let the player do mouse button press. We'll use the left button. So they can push the left button. Let's do the space bar. And if you like games like Geometry Dash, they use the up arrow. So let's do another one. So you can push any of these things. Heck, why don't we just add game pads while we're at it? You do need to make sure you install the game pad extension with this button. I already installed it. So let's add a game pad. And I'm going to say any button pressed. So you can use any button on your controller. Since this is a one button game, that should work. And we want to use a trigger once so that you have to release the button before you get another jump. We need to push simulate the jump key for the cat. All right, let's try that. Oh, there we go. So up arrow works, space works, click works. This is working pretty good. 
the character is going up and down and it's going to the right. There's something else we can do to make this look somewhat more similar to the Flappy Bird game. In the Flappy Bird game, the bird kind of rotates as it jumps. There's a kind of a cheat to do this in GDevelop. I built a, an extension called Face Forward. So if you search for a face forward, it faces the objects towards the direction of the movement. Let's just set it to 720 degrees turning speed. Now when this player is moving, you can see it faces the direction it's moving. So that's what the face forward extension does. Super fun, super easy. And if you just click like this, it's just a fun little twist. Okay, player movement is done. Obviously, we need obstacles now. Let's add a wall. We still want to use a tiled sprite. Mm, let's use these. Oh, this is called grass. I'll just call it wall. So we're going to make little walls for this cat to go over. And in Flappy Bird, it's bottom and a top one. And we could create these manually. So this will just be our test to see if things are going to look good and work well. All right, so we just create those manually. You could make hundreds of those if you want to, but I, I'm i going to show you a better way in a minute. This looks fine, but we don't want to have to create hundreds of those. What if someone gets to a score of 1,000? You don't want to create 1,000 of these. So we want to do it procedurally. That uh, term is often called procedural generation. That's a pretty fancy term for create things automatically, and it's easy enough to do. Let's delete these ones that we did manually, and we're just going to create them just right here at the edge. We're going to do one here and then one here. I should probably set the default size. When you create these, they're going to be this size, which is set here on 128 by 128. I want them about 64 by 288. So now when we create them, the walls will be that size. Perfect. So I, I'm going to try to create these using events. We need to know how fast this is going to happen. Let's use a repeat every X seconds. And we'll say create wall. And let's try it every three seconds. Every three seconds, we will make a wall. And we're going to position it at the right side of this camera and the Y position at the top. And let's just see how that looks, because I think that's important to see. I still have to delete my manual ones. All right, let's try it again. Ready, go. Show me a wall. Okay, we have a wall. There's no collisions yet. That's fine. But look, it's making lots of walls. In fact, it'll make these walls for all eternity. Isn't that nice? You can have a score of a million, and you don't have to make them. We do need to make the bottom one, so let's copy this. And instead of creating it at the top, let's try creating it at the center Y. Okay, we are pretty good, but obviously not in the right spot. I think actually I have an idea of how to make this work. If I want to create this in only 10 events, this is taking two of my actions. So instead of using two actions, we can actually do this in a single action by using an external layout. To create an external layout, click here and give it a name. And then you select your scene that you're going to, the objects are located in. So we're now in this create walls external layout. I'm going to set my grid again. We're going to have a top wall and a bottom wall. It's important that you place them at the top left here, the 0, 0 position, because that's where it references how they're going to be created in your level. So instead of creating them like this, let's say create objects from an external layout. We're going to create walls. And we're creating these similar to previous. We're going to stay on the right side of the screen. And we're going to do it at the top of the screen. We have our walls here. Let's see how that looks. Perfect. Okay, this works, but we want to add some randomness to their placement. So let's keep this at the right side, but we're going to move this up and down using the random in range function. And we will choose a negative value so that it can go up or to a positive value where it can go down. I'm using that 32 by 32 grid. So this is basically letting us go seven blocks up or seven blocks down. These are the blocks. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It can go up or down in blocks. Let's see what that looks like. That one looks centered. That one looks centered. That one looks way down, but still you can go through it. Okay, so I think that's working. There is a downside in that we have a gap on the top and the bottoms. All right, let's just adjust them so that these are much longer. In fact, I'm going to make them the same length as the entire screen, like so. And we'll just put them in approximately the right spots. So now they just have a little extra on the ends. And that should take care of what we are seeing. Okay, there we go. The walls are created procedurally, and they've got some randomness for the player. What should we add next? We obviously need collisions. So when the player hits these walls, the game is over. So let's detect that. 
will say when the cat is in collision with the wall. We only need to detect this collision one time, so I'll use a trigger once. We want to stop the movement of the cat. We can do that with a lot of options. We can just uh, disable the, the platformer behavior and it will freeze in place because that's the only thing that's moving it. All right, let's see if that works. So now when we touch a wall, the cat's just gonna freeze in place and that could be your game over condition. One other important part of the Flappy Bird game is the ability to see your score. Let's add a score text object. We'll click text. We'll call this score and we'll make it white. We'll choose a fun font. Why don't we do like a black outline? And so in the game, it'll look like this. Oh, but see how it's moving like that? We don't want it to move. So we'll create a new layer for our UI elements and they will no longer move when the base layer camera moves. Now we need to create some code to update the number that's displayed here. So how can we count the score? One way to do it is to count how many walls are to the left of the cat. Let's create a condition for walls where their center position of the wall is less than the center position of the cat. And this will count how many walls are to the left of the cat. And to display them, we're going to click the score text, update the text, and there's a picked instances count. Return the number of instances picked by the previous conditions. That's what we want. And our object is called wall. Let's test this. Currently it says one, two, three. Oh, that's because the condition was not true until we passed at least one object. But the, the counting looks good, except for obviously it's counting by two because these are two different objects. So we should just divide that in half. And what else do we need to change? Oh, the default to say zero. So that's, we'll just change this to say zero. Let's test it. So our score is zero. We'll go through our first ones. Yeah, a score of one, perfect. Two, and if we hit the walls, the game's over. Let's make a button show up that the user can click to restart the game. If we add new object, choose a button. I think I'll use this one and we'll call this play again button. We'll use the same font that we had earlier, the ranchers. Play again is our text. Let's see what this button looks like. Okay, the size is not right. Let's make it the size we want. And to change it permanently, we need to copy these values onto the custom object. We'll just do that here. 288 by 128. All right. Okay, so now you can see that that'll be created the right size. We'll delete these and we'll create it in an event. Let's create that button after the cat collides with the wall. We can use the camera center for the UI layer and we'll want to subtract the width of the object and the same for the Y position. And we do want to create it on the UI layer. Okay, the button is there, and but it doesn't do anything. So let's create an action for that. Condition is when the button is clicked and we will change the scene and you can choose the scene you want to restart. So we should have a full game loop right now. If I hit play again, the game restarts. Perfect. Okay, how many actions have we used so far? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We do have the basics of this game working, but there's still some ways we can optimize it to look a lot better. For instance, we really need a background. Let's search the asset store. Okay, here is a cloud background I think would look nice. Thanks, Kenny, for the asset. And we'll just drag this onto the background. We do need to create a new layer so that it doesn't go on top of everyone. We'll call this layer background and we'll drag it to the bottom of the stack and we'll put this new object on the background. And let's adjust it so that the clouds are not touching the ground. Let's see what this looks like. That's pretty nice. There is a fun little trick. You guys are gonna love this. We can add parallax to this background so that it looks like it's moving at a slower speed than the items in the foreground. It's so easy to do. Just double click on your object, search your behaviors and choose parallax. And we're gonna use the horizontal parallax. And this is the, the uh, layer we're gonna follow. We can just leave that blank for the base layer, the parallax factor. So currently it's gonna go 0.5 speed. This is what the default speed looks like. It's gonna go half the speed of the foreground. But I feel like that's too fast in this case. We want the clouds to move very slow. So let's try maybe like 0.2 speed. So as we're going along flying, you'll see that the background is also moving and it's looping. So it actually looks like it's kind of never ending. And that's a really cool feature of tiled sprites with the parallax behavior that we added. So it wasn't that easy. Let's do the same thing for the ground. See how the ground is gone now? 
let's make the ground do the same thing. We'll double click that and choose parallax, horizontal, and we'll put the grass on the background layer and let's check it out. Oh, that looks really bad. The, uh, the grass needs to go the same speed as the foreground. So we're going to edit at speed and instead of 0.5, we'll choose one. That means it'll move the same speed as the walls. That looks great. And it didn't take any actions to do it. So we still have a couple actions that we can use. What else can we do to make this game look and sound great? Well, that was the hint. We should make it sound great. Let's add a sound effect when the player is jumping. We will use this existing event with a condition for when the player pushes the jump key. And we will play a sound. And let's choose sound from the asset store. There's actually hundreds of sounds in here that you can play with. I'm going to search for one that I like. Okay, I found this jump sound. I like to start with a volume of 50 so we can always increase or decrease it. And pitch is how fast it's going to be played. Let's see what this sounds like. I think that sounds great. It is a little boring because there's a fun trick that Helper Wesley taught me. We can change the pitch of the sound every time by using random with step. And we will set this to 0.8 to 1.2. And the step will be 0.2. So this actually will have three values. It could be 0.8, 1.0, or 1.2. And this will add some variety to the sound. For our 10th action, let's play some music. This is another song that I found inside the GDevelop Asset Store. And we will choose to loop it so the player can keep playing forever. Let's see what our music sounds like. Okay, I like that because it's just a relaxing beat that makes the game feel less stressful than it can, uh, can be at times. In fact, my goal for this game is to make it easy to play and not as stressful as the actual Flappy Bird game there are a couple things I forgot to include. For instance, the player can go off the screen like this and fly as high as they want, and sometimes they can actually get over those walls. So we want to make sure the player cannot do that. What we can do is add a behavior to the player, and the behavior is stay on screen. When we add this behavior, it should prevent the player from leaving the screen. Uh, it does have a little bit of jitter, which we could probably address, but of course it would take some new events to do that. But at least now they can't leave the screen. The other thing I noticed is that the player doesn't die when they hit the ground. They just kind of bounce on it. We can add a condition to this action that determines if the player is colliding with a wall. We need to turn this into an or condition. And we will say the cat bottom is greater than the, the top of the floor. We do need to disable the platform behavior, which is keeping the player from touching the ground. So we'll just delete a platform behavior. Now let's try it out. There you go. Now when the player hits the ground, it makes the game end just like hitting a wall. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. That's it. That's our ten actions. That's all we got for this game. Don't forget to check out my other video where I made the Vampire Survivors clone in ten events just like this one. Be sure to subscribe so you don't miss my next video. Thanks for watching and I will see you guys on the next one. Bye bye.